Can you hear me, Dr. Marconi? Shoot. David, do you hear me? I hear you fine. Something's it's really slow. I think I'm back so again. Uh, <laughs> he just joined twice. <laughs> I have I, this. For those of you watching live, we're trying to do this Google Hangout, and Google doesn't make it very easy for people to hang out. I'm no. serious. D uh, Mar see Dr. The, Marconi. See the draft? Do you have a picture of a draft down at the bottom? I have a picture no. of, I have two pictures of you. And no picture of a draft? No. Nope. Oh, well, the draft's my, uh, it's my picture from my Gmail. <laughs> I don't know why it's on there, but I'm on there. Dave's on there, David's on there, and the draft is on there. <laughs> Go ahead, carry on. Do you, see any, do you see any video at all? Yeah, I got everything. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, including the giraffe. All right. So now we're six minutes behind, and I'm just furious, and I'm having problems keeping my anger in. So we'll move right into this. So David Deutsch of Synergy Social, explain who you are, what you do. Go. Thank you. My name is David Deutsch. My company is Synergy Social, social media strategy for companies who are frightened by Facebook, terrified of Twitter, or lost on LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, I was once run over by a giant pig. I, I, I always love that, especially the whole thing. You, you made that up on the spot, which I think is really great. You should have been a rapper, not a social media maven. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, I should have done improv rap. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it, David, do you mind if people call you a maven? As long as they don't call me stupid. That's very nice, very nice. A lot so, of people call me the nickname for Richard. And <laughs> Tell us about you, Dave, uh, Dave Philp. Uh, a little right. bit about me, just a little bit. I am Dave Philp. I run a company called You Choose, and we are a live music events and social media company. We put on live music events built around one decade of music in order to raise funds for wonderful, great causes. In fact, just last weekend, we raised money for the <laughs> Wayne Township, New Jersey Division of Social Services, which provides supermarket gift cards to hungry families in the town. And Dr. Stephen Marconi, who is our guest today, chairman of the Music Management Department at William Patterson University, also played trumpet with our band wow. at this event. So it's great to have That's Dr. Stephen Marconi with us today. Very nice. And what we were saying before we had technical difficulties is you've been in the music management department at William Patterson University for 28 years. Correct. What are some of the changes as an educator? Well, how about one step back? What is the what is a music management department? What is your I guess mission statement? What are you who are you teaching? What are you teaching? Well, we actually started out with this in offering an alternative career for musicians. The musicians usually go to school to be performers or be teachers. And we also said, why can't musicians do something in their own business? Why can't they be business savvy? And we knew a bunch of musicians that could balance a checkbook and could come in under budget. And why not teach them all the rest? I fell into it because I was on Columbia Records in the 70s and was given a real shot. I mean, I'm supposed to be in one of the super groups. And uh, when all around the country, arenas opening up, actually, for arena bands for, the, for about four years. And then uh, we never, um, we realized we needed better management than we had, because we had what many bands have, a guy who was pretty smart, but he couldn't swim at the Barracudas, and he lived in Syracuse, and we trusted him. And by the time uh, we realized that we really needed to get a Barracuda, it was too late, because you only get one shot. So it always had been a sort of a, a you know, a, a sort of a, a, a trait of mine to not try not to let that happen to every musician, but to try to teach musicians about entrepreneurship and about personal management and so on. So that's my end is personal management. There's a book called Managing Your Band that I have in fifth edition. Oh, that's the fourth edition. Okay, but that's good enough. And um, and what we do at the university is we try to center in on the three major revenue streams today. One is, of course, the live stream and uh, merchandising and everything that goes along with live and teaching them about agents and managers and promoters and so on. The second stream, of course, is licensing. We're not uh, beside merchandising, but you're licensing songs for various uses, whether it be television or it be ringtones or it be a singing fish on the wall. 
And then the third uh, revenue, which people used to think was a primary revenue stream, was the recorded music revenue. Uh, but um, I guess it was Coldplay and Prince, and, uh, um, not Coldplay, uh, Radiohead and Prince and so on, that figured out pretty early that they never made money uh, on royalty, um, record royalties. So why not we give the music away in terms of using the music as a vehicle for beefing up other revenue streams. So I think that's what's really occurring today is not only do the uh, managers have more power than they ever had, but the revenue stream thing is sort of aligning itself, I think, where it really always was. But people got the idea that once you had a record contract, you were going to start to make million do uh, millions of dollars. Last year alone, um, if you figure a group is into a major label for about two hundred thousand dollars a day, the record is dropped. The um, last year there were about two hundred or so titles of albums that sold um, um, two hundred thousand copies or better, and that was two hundred titles out of 858,000 titles last year sold one copy, at least one copy. Some sold more copies, but sold one copy. So if you take 200 and divide that with the 858,000, you're about 0.0004% of the records that sold last year sold enough for a group to break even, especially on a major label. And forget about independence. I mean, this, there was um, out of, I think, about um, 12 platinum records, maybe 25 gold records. There was a one independent record that made, that sold um, 500,000 copies last year. So if you're with a major, you've got to be in for two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. You just have to be. And you know, your chances are 0.0004% in uh, 2011. You know, Adele sold a lot of records, but Adele, everybody's saying Adele is the thriller of this millennium. You know, should that, that, that's an anomaly, that record. That's not going to happen in, uh, for a while, even though Taylor Swift did do uh, marvelously a couple of weeks ago with being in selling, uh, you know, a million copies in one week, which has really been unheard of in this entire millennium as well. So we teach all the way from the bachelors. We have a minor in music management for students that want to be comm majors or business majors and they'll still want to do the music management or music business thing, all the way up to an MBA in music management. And there's only um, one other school actually that does it in-house, offers an MBA in the music business, and that's uh, Belmont University in, um, in Nashville, and it's a Christian school actually. So that's what we do. And yours is a Muslim school, right? Yes, that is actually. <laughs> it's a madras, a music madras. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> David, your oh. lips moved a minute ago. What was you had a question for the speaker of the house? <laughs> yes, I was. I was. I was pantomiming actually. <laughs> no, um, I wanted to know about the. Um, you said album sales mm -hmm. are like maybe a handful go platinum or gold, but what about like you? I wanted to go into this of like i iTunes and you know the fact that albums. I mean, it, it goes in waves. I mean, you know, in the 70s, yeah. it was singles. Well, but, the, you, know, you can count that. What iTunes does is we call we call it track equivalencies, TEAs. So 10 single downloads equals one album. They call it an album. Even if it's 10 from, doesn't matter where it's from. So that's they, that's how you, they beef up the album, you know, the, the, the album sales figures. I see. So it's, it's, they've, they've done, been doing that for quite a while now. Actually, that factors in. Okay, I see. Which is yeah, because it's a singles business. We know that now. Right. Now let let's go back years to to when you were an artist. You were a recording artist, and also mm -hmm. you mentioned for four years you were an opening act. What was the name of your band, and and at what point did you guys start to realize that you did not have a Barracuda, and what were some of the opportunities that were missed because you did not have management that you, you know, in hindsight, right. could have been a lot better for you? Yeah, that's a good question because um, basically we were a considered a super group. It was in the early 70s, we were an integrated group, and we were written up not only in the music trades, but we were written up in People magazine and 
whatever else was around that time, Newsweek and, and so on and so forth. And um, what happened is we continued to play uh, arenas as opening acts, but we were extremely good live act. So there had to be a point where we were going to start to um, be the headliner. And we did one album for Columbia, it was really Epic Records, and we did one uh, single for them, and we were invited to the, there's a, um, I'm, David knows for sure, I'm sure, but Universal is the year, yearly convention conference mm -hmm. where all the uh, sales guys go and so on and so forth. And we were invited to perform there, and we were really considered to be right in the, because we were a horn band as well, right in the footsteps of Blood, Sweat, and Tears in Chicago, and we were in between uh, those bands and Earth, Wind, and Fire, and, and so on and so forth. So we um, had every opportunity. I mean, there was we can't say that we blamed Epic Records or we blamed ICM, which was our agency at the time. Um, they really, really weren't to blame. What was to blame was to keep you as a priority in the record company because there's so many acts that are buying for just 24 hours a day from these gatekeepers that you needed someone to be in the center of the business the whole time and being there and just being visible because you didn't have to do much more. We were able to stand on our own two feet no matter what we did. So consequently, we, we didn't, never got that. He always lived with us, and he never, never went down into the center of the industry. So when we uh, decided to try to go with some other guys, by that time, we were, start, we were starting to be on our downswing in terms of we were out there long enough to make it, and we didn't make it. I mean, we were, we were it wasn't a question that we had been working previously but we were on Epic Records for about four years or so, and we should have made some noise. And we didn't make noise, and by the time we realized why we didn't make noise, we actually were started on the down side. And then managers were questioning whether they really wanted to um, invest their time in us, because there was, you know, every two weeks there's another group that comes up, and so on. So I think that was really the the time and then we did what I call the mortal sin we tried to manage ourselves for a while the Beatles tried that too uh, it really when you don't have any insulation between the industry and you as a creative person it's, it's just it, it's virtually impossible to um, to get anything done on the creative side so that I think that was really the point and uh, I don't think that's any really any different today. I mean, today it's all about the model is take your potential fan, make him a passive fan, and hopefully some at some point you're going to make him a fanatic fan. So he's going to go from passive to active to fanatic, and obviously it's a, a pyramid, so up top you have the fanatic fan that spends more money than the passive fan, but of course they're fewer. So you can do that a, a million different ways. There's no one, you know, there's, there's no one model. I mean, just figure it out through social media or whatever way you want to do, freemium model, whatever you think is going to work for you. But that's that's the model today. And if you're not radio friendly, if you're not a Britney or an Adele or something, you don't need a, a label. And acts are, even, even acts that are radio friendly now are realizing that because they're putting out their own apps. And you buy their app and you're going to have everything. And then eventually you will be a subscriber to a Lady Gaga app and you'll have everything she does. As, as an app, the the labels now are putting out apps too, but the but the the artists can bypass that basically if they realize they're not going to make money selling records. <laughs> you know, look at the royalty statements, and even Little Wayne said it uh, fairly recently. He says every time you might every time that you're supposed to get a check, they bring you into the studio again, or they do something not to pay you. But they, they just unless you're making Adele type money for them where they have to pay you. They just have to. You're making too much money. They've got to give you money. They're not going to get, they're going to try everything they possibly can not to pay you any money. And remember, you make about a buck an album or 10 ETAs, and they make about seven or eight bucks on it. So they recoup far quicker. You know, it'll take you 200,000 copies to recoup. It'll take them somewhere around 30,000 to recoup. 
and um, believe you me, worldwide, they'll sell 30,000 of junk, you know, if they want to. So there are very few groups that they have that don't, that they don't make, at least break even on. Even though I'm, I'm, you, you lost me a Lady Gaga app, so I'm sorry. I didn't hear anything after that. All I heard oh. was Lady Gaga app. I was like, whoop. God, you'll, <laughs> have, to read, you'll have to read the uh, summary after. I'm but not saying that, we, that artists are having their own apps, but putting all their stuff on it, uh, including videos, including what size shoe Lady Gaga wears, where do you get that dress, who did her hair, so on and so forth. Uh, labels are doing that now, but acts can bypass the label if they really I mean the other thing label has is terrestrial radio really in in your in your favor and they're a bank if you think you want you know you need money but if you're just putting downloads from your website or through any of the portals I, I mean why do you need them why why share and they want you to share everything now of course because the 360 deal includes things that they never did and they expect you to pay them 30 or 40 percent or 20 percent of, of, of things that you are using as revenue streams. And what are they doing for it? All they're doing is supporting your recording costs, really. I mean, they've hired guys to do that, but, you know, I mean, the band, part of the band's team now is somebody who does web, either webmaster or a service or whatever, and they can do whatever needs to be done that the record companies are doing it just doesn't it doesn't pay if you're not a Britney or if you're not 50 cent or if you're not you know doesn't pay for you to, to be with them anymore and they know it <laughs> I mean they're fully aware of it so they cried the blues they said you know we don't um, we can't make money off of, because you guys are stealing music we can't make money anymore we got to take we got to make money from all your other revenue streams. And, uh, well, how did you guys blow this? You know, you guys blew it. You had the opportunity to, as soon as it's before Napster, you had the opportunity to get into MP3s and you ignored it. So, um, consequently, the smarter, smarter bands know this and they're, you know, doing it. If you go back, let's go back to say ninety. When did Napster come out? Like ninety eight, ninety nine? Yeah, right? roughly the late nineties. Yeah. Um, if you go back to that time, mm -hmm. it, it seems that everything truly creative to come out of the music industry has not come from the major labels. Obviously, Napster came from a kid in a dorm. Yeah. Um, iTunes came from Apple, mm -hmm. uh, and and then uh, things like Spotify. You know, right. services right. like that are all outside the industry. Yeah. What is the last thing you would say that the the traditional music industry, you know, major labels have done that really has been like a game changer? Right. Or has it all been outside? Tech, the tech guys are the new rock stars. There's no question. Tech guys are the new rock stars. The rock stars are cashing in, whether it's the Eagles or the Stones or whomever. You know, it's the independent bands, of course, coming up, but the tech guys are the new rock stars. The tech guys are going, no, no, we don't do it that way. We do it this way now. And this is the way you're going to do it because it's easier, it's friendly, it's this is it. And it's, it's cost effective. I mean, most of the stuff the tech guys have done is free today. You know, the freemium model is a majority of us, like Spotify, will, like on Spotify, will get the stuff for free. And then if you want extras like mobile or something, then you, you pay. And that's that you have to give it away today. You, you, that, that's the model. The model is free. And there's a big difference between free and five cents. You walk out of a movie theater and there's a kiosk there and it says free candy. You're going to put your hand in there? If it says the same candy's in there and it says five cents, what are you going to do? You're going to walk past it. Not because you're cheap or so on. It's just human nature. So it's the the model is the freemium model today, you know that's the that's it really. Uh, Chris Anderson has just written another book now because he wrote Long Tail, then he wrote Free, which was a great book as well, uh, and he's got a new one out called the the Industrial Revolution, where he's again talking about the techie guys and what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I, I my hats off to 
technology because they really are. They're the ones that are challenging the status quo. I mean, look at the American Music Awards last night. What did you see? Nothing, really. Mm -hmm. All I saw was that they have improved Vary lights to the extent where they're so annoying now. The green I mean, lights in the background? Yeah, yeah, the lights that spin and so on, Vary yeah. lights that came out in the 80s and whatever. I mean, they're just, I mean, it's obnoxious what it is, you know. Well, did you see the biggest innovation, though, last night was instead of handing out an envelope, they handed out a Samsung, um, yeah. you know, a, a, whatever, a notebook or something that yeah, they yeah. would open up, and that was how you saw who the winner was. Right, some sort of tablet, right? I know. But um, where are the people challenging, you know? I remember one time, um, God, it was the Grammys. I don't know if you remember, it was in the 90s, and U2 came out, and you, he said, fuck, on the air. And they didn't have a delay. It came right out. And I said, then I said, somebody's got to get fired. Because it's, <laughs> how did this pass? How could this have come out? No delay on the Grammys. And he was making a point, a statement about something. You know, we don't, there's nothing. You watch the MTV Awards when it was in September. Not, there's nobody challenging status quo. And that supposedly was the whole heart of, of the revolution, was to rebel, you know, appetite for destruction of some sort, or disruption even today. Mm -hmm. The new music seminar said this summer. So it's the tech guys that come out and say, you know, look, now we got a tablet that's three and a half inches, um, and we're going to tell you why you should buy this, you know. And no matter what they do, they're, they're far ahead of the, uh, of the, the far, they're far ahead in the progress of making change than anyone else is today. So, yeah. <laughs> David, so, your, your turn. Oh, okay, thanks. So, you know, it's uh, when you say the tech guys are in charge, um, do you mean in terms of driving sales? Do you mean in... in what no, do you, what I mean, do you mean in innovation and challenging the status quo. Oh, I see. I see. Just challenging the status quo. Because, I mean, like, I know that, like, you know, people are complaining rightfully and have been for years that uh, MTV is reality television and uh, has nothing to do with music. Yeah, nothing. You know, nothing at all to do with mm -hmm. music, music television. And <laughs> I, I mean, used to, I mean... Video killed the radio star. Obviously, it was the first, you know, one, and that was disruptive at the time. It almost seems like after that sure. was played, they became the establishment. Like almost yeah. the second song, suddenly they became the establishment, and um, they came, they became people, the establishment so much that early MTV with the little spaceman and so on. Yeah, in the eighties when MTV came out, eighty four, eighty two, whatever, you could go up the, the dial, and then there might have been eighty stations counting cable and. Secondary transmission and then primary transmission, transmission, the cable station. When you got to MTV, you knew you were on MTV. You knew it. Not because the little guy, just because they created a brand of MTV, of a station. And no other station ever has even come close. Fox sort of dabbled with coming close to, and, and Warner 11, whatever it is here in New York City, sort of has come close. But nobody had branded like they branded. And it was it was new. It was refreshing, and the videos were nonlinear, right. so there was never it wasn't a beginning, a middle, the end. It wasn't uh, I don't know. Seinfeld comes out, and then the uh, Kramer walks in, and then they do nothing, and then they solve it. No, I mean you would see these videos where Jagger would stick his tongue at you, and then they'd go and it'd be raining, and then Jagger would stick his tongue, and somebody would cut it off, and and it ended, and you'd go, what? That was unbelievable. <laughs> So when when radio when television tried that with um, they tried it with a show called Twin Peaks first if you remember that show David Lynch it was a nonlinear show so it was it was really fresh and new and exciting but MTV had already done an MTV you knew you were on an MTV today you can go past the dial you'll pass MTV day parting whatever sitcoms that are doing you'll just pass right by them today so they've lost the edge too you know or what's Howard Stern would say, I guess, jumped the shark years ago, you know. I remember I remember Sam Kinison, I think, years ago, hosted the MTV Music Awards. Mm -hmm. He said live on air, said, I shouldn't say this, but MTV should get back to playing music. And yeah, just, right. Was, well, they did. They tried M2, you know, which was the music channel, because they didn't want to hurt the 
the, the primary channel because they were still getting um, viewers. Right. You know, now they've got the reality shows and all the, it's day parted though, and they never day parted. It was 24 hour videos, you know. As John Sykes said when it came out, and, and Bob Pittman, who now is the head of, I, of uh, Clear Channel, and John Sykes, who was his buddy, was is the head of iHeartRadio now. They're still together, although they separated for many years. But John Sykes used to say, "We're just we're like a gallery MTV, and we hang the videos. We just they pass our sensor test, and we hang them on a wall, just like that's that's what we do. We don't want to get involved with." with what we show and so on, we're just hanging them. And then they got criticized, of course, for not doing any black music. And Walter Yetnikoff, the time the head of CBS record groups, decided he was going to pull every CBS video if they didn't stop doing uh, playing black acts. And that's how Michael Jackson got on it and so on, because they refused to do that. Then they went through their raps, you know, the bum rap and whatever those shows were and, and so on and so forth, because they couldn't deny hip hop obviously but um yeah it's a non-factor today you know mtv it really is yeah it doesn't do anything for for new acts you know yeah. the only thing that does well for new acts is 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 great music supervisors like um uh, chop shop who does uh, gray's anatomy and several others and they have found on the internet groups like the fray and so on and they put them on television as, as soundtracks, and it's become actually a viable way to sort of uh, get known, you know, and there's, there's several acts that have done it that way. And it was really the music supervisors who just went against doing the old same old, you know, whether it would be the guy that does the soundtrack like Henry Mancini did or, or just doing canned music. You know, they, they went and looked for acts that they that were new and different that would attract a younger audience to watch those shows. And it worked. And there's, there's several still great music supervisors out there doing it that way. But in terms of the establishment, getting back to Dave Phillips' question, I, I really can't think of anything that the majors have done in the, in the last 10, 15 years. You know, they know and, how and to you they, I mean, and when they get an act, and, they, and it's a radio-friendly act, they do know how to sell records. I mean, they moved Doug Morris from Euro Company over to Sony, and everybody said, what the hell is Sony doing with a 72-year-old guy bringing him in? But look at Sony's numbers now. They're off the wall. You know, it was Stringer that did Glee, but after that, it, I mean, they're, they're off. They're doing extremely well. He knows how to sell records. I mean, he just does. He's got that. You know, he's he's that type of an executive. And, and going back to something you said a, a little while ago when you were mentioning, you know, um, tech or the new rock stars. Like, for example, um, when you were talking about disruption in the 70s, you know, uh, the disruption to disco was punk. And it was the clash of the Sex Pistols. Yeah, and um, then I, I guess in the 80s maybe it became heavy metal before that became very... Sort well, of I think what happened is you had all those haircut bands because you had a video president. You had Reagan, who was a who was a movie star. Mm -hmm. The video had to take off. I mean, timing of MTV was was appropriate, but it was during the Reagan years. I mean, we were all into that that medium. And then, of course, we got tired of the haircut bands. So then Seattle came in. It's always a reaction, you know. And then, in the meantime, hip hop developed because look at the black music of the age. You had, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and are they talking about the ghetto? I mean, are they talking about really what was happening in the streets? No, the hip-hop guys had to come in and, and uh, be a communique, as, as uh, what's-his-name says with Public Enemy, because they wanted, to, to, they wanted that kid in Kansas City, Kansas, to know what was happening in South Central and what was happening in the Bronx and so on. So the early, early rap was, was a great you know, vehicle for communication. It just it got watered down, and it got gangstered, and it got it splintered like everything else splinters. Is but, it po is it possible today then for there to be that one disruptive, such as the Seattle scene, or such as as a, a hip hop movement, with the way the internet is, and the way there are so many options now for people to yeah. get their their music and their culture versus even. In, uh, when hip-hop was really taking hold in the, in the really big time, like in the 90s, 
it was still pre-Napster. It was still oh, yeah. uh, pre-internet. I mean, now it's it's wide open. Yeah, hip hop was really in the seventies. Actually, when it when it started with uh, you know with uh, Africa Bambata and all those bands that came out of uh, Sugar Hill and so on. Well, you do, do you but, call rap and hip hop? What do you call it? What's the difference between rap well, and hip hop? I, I like to think hip hop is like the bigger umbrella, mm -hmm. and then under it might be rap, and under it still might be R and B, and so on. I mean, that's the way I look at it. But uh, hip hop being urban, sort of an urban black style. Would you, would you argue, might you argue that Amy Winehouse was the latest disruptive musical? Influence? I think she serves. I think, but I think you know. My question has always been: Why haven't we had a band out of the Middle East? Here we have another Hamas Gaza Strip thing happening in the last week or so on, and there's no band to talk about. I mean, you two, you two did that IRA thing to get on the map. They were all over the Irish, you know, the Catholics versus the Protestants in the in their era. And I, it's just amazing to me we haven't ever hooked up with with something coming out of the the Middle East. Uh, well, you could also you could argue the same for even Mexico, you know, which is even that much closer to America with yeah. the, the drug wars and those tremendous yeah uh, economic issues there. But I, I think it goes back to something you um, taught me many years ago in that um, it, it's tough for a non English. Yeah, speaking, singing, act to to make it right in, in the mean, United I, States. So that might be the middle Middle East issue. Yeah, although they would have to sing in English. You know, why is Bollywood popular? Well, because it's English. I mean, India is English basically, so that's why Bollywood is easy to make that that transfer. You know, it's also hilarious, by the way. Yeah, well, look how long it took Korea. You know, Korean pop. How long many years have they been? pushing these stupid 14 and 15 year old girl groups, you know, these little fragile things. And then Psy comes over with just a good time and he creates a Korean Macarena. I mean, and everybody's on it. And sure, I mean, they, the Scooter uh, Braun signed him and shipped him over immediately. He said, cause he's a, I mean, Psy's a time bomb. He's gonna, he's gonna go to nothing soon, you know. That was his sixth album. And out of this, on the sixth album came this this um, Gang Yang style. I, I, incidentally, I saw it on a Saturday. I was flipping, watching football. Got to the uh, to the Latino station, and there was this Spanish band that had to be twenty people on stage, guitars and cellos and flutes and so on. And they finished the Spanish ballad. And what do they do? They do Gang Yang style in, in Spanish. It was a riot. Oh, it was great. I loved it. <laughs> But that's, you know, how did that happen? Well, he got on YouTube and it, and it exploded. I mean, right now, what's the band, um, Brett, Brett O'Moore? Brett, they, did a, um, they did a tune called Jimmy Yovine, where they, I don't know if you've seen it, and they bashed the heart of him in the video, and we played the video in class a couple of weeks ago. Now all the majors, uh, they just said that uh, L.A. Reid flew out to the Midwest to catch... Their uh, their act and a lot of kids in my class are listening to them, totally. They found this niche. They started to talk. They talked about Jimmy Irvine and how what they pro what they said basically is screw you. We're not going to take your deal, you know. But they talk about how they get to the building and and they go up there and the secretaries and the cubicles and they're walking through and they finally and there he is and they're so disappointed. Hmm. They expected so much more, you know, and so on. And he tells a man, and he gives him a deal, and they say the deal in the rap, and the deals, you know, and he goes, and it's a pretty good deal. He says, I've seen a lot worse, and they said, no, you know, no, thank you. We'll keep 100% of nothing is basically what they said. But they're off the wall now. They're, I mean, the video's going viral, and uh, they're getting bites. So there's no one method of doing it, you know. So I can't answer your question and say, well, with the Internet, will we have that opportunity? We might very well have that opportunity, you know. We really don't know. Did you see the Romney style, the video Romney style? It's about yeah. 20 million hits now. You know, Psy is at 500 million hits. But um, Romney style was just a riot. I mean, an absolute, probably still off, absolute riot on gang, you know, takeoff on gang and stuff. And um, I saw, I saw, 
I saw I'm a Romney girl in a in a Romney world. That was kind of funny. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. There's a there's a, a rap video too. Obama I'm a Romney, girl in his Romney out of uh, Australia. Actually, that's getting a lot of play. I don't know if it's still getting play now, but so uh, it's exciting. I think it's still we still preach it's the best time ever to get into this business because nobody's in control. You don't have to go through the record company. All corner offices and so on. Find your niche, take that passive fan, and make him into a fanatic fan. And um, you'll you'll make enough money so that you don't have to do something else. You know, I'm not going to tell you you're going to be rich, but you make enough money, you don't have to do something else. And people still, we still get him at school. The student at school was pretty hip in social media. I mean, he took he took the department as a junior, and he made the Facebook page and the department page and he started Twitter and so on and so forth. So he made a CD a couple of, uh, two summers ago. So I said, well, first of all, I've been preaching don't make a CD for years now, but he made a CD. I said, so uh, what's your objective with the CD? He said, I want to get more students into my private studio because I teach piano privately. I said, so why are you selling this thing? Why don't you give it away? So, well, I might make, you know, I want to make some money made to pay back the, the production of it. And I said, you'd be better off mowing lawns. Just go out and mow, mow your neighbor's lawns. For, you're going to make more money than selling the CD to your, to your friends. Use, this, use the music as a tool for getting people in the studio. That's what you want to do. And that's exactly what, what groups are doing now. They're using the music. I, 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 you know the ukulele orchestra of Great Britain? Oh, you got to pull up the go YouTube. Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain. They do like uh, all these rock tunes. There's eight ukulele players, and they do all these rock tunes. So two years ago, the YouTube phenomenon. Two years ago, they played Carnegie Hall, the basement. I think it's 110 seats, Zankel Hall. This year, I just saw them in October. They played the main hall, Stern Hall. You know, 3,000 people, 500 people, probably 500 people brought their ukuleles. And they did a participation. They did a takeoff on Terry Riley's in C. They called it uh, devastatingly in C or something, or obnoxiously in C or something. And these 500 people played. And so the point I'm getting to is this, you know, they're not on a major label. So what do you see? Usually, well, remember outside in the, uh, outside in the lobby, we've got DVDs and T-shirts and, you know, we've got CDs for sale. He said, out in the lobby, pick up a card. He says, and on the card is free downloads. Just take them and use them. And I just said, they just, they got it. They know what they're doing. And the downloads actually weren't their better tunes because you can get everything they do on YouTube. But, but um, and incidentally, I went home that night, and two hours later, the, the concert was on YouTube. They were allowing, they were allowing us to take pictures and use our cameras and, and so on. I took a bunch of videos with them, and I was sending them out on, on Facebook. So they're doing it with live. They went from 110 seats to to 3,000 seats in two years, and they're from Great Britain, and not even from America. Ukuleles. I mean, ukuleles, can you imagine? And they're probably from 30 years old to 60 years old in the in the group. So the guy, the one of the older guys, 60, sings Shaft, and they play, you know, they're playing with well, and he sings shaft all the words he's shaft you know can you dig it he's a mean mother and so on it's a right it's a, it, it's just great i mean it's and they play well of course so there's always there's a way to do it that's why we say that it's the greatest time just be an entrepreneur find that niche do what you have to do and you know and do it look at what amanda palmer did i mean you know she's supposed to get ten thousand dollars she got over a million dollars on Kickstarter. But if you watch that original video where she holds up the cards and she's throwing the cards and saying, I mean, it's, it's a great piece. You just want to give her money because she's, def she's defying the norm, you know, by saying we were on a major label. We don't want to do this anymore. We don't like being in the hole, so on and so forth. We want to do it ourselves and, and so on. So she got her money. <laughs> she got a lot more. She did goof, though, because a few weeks ago she was putting out um, to, to anybody who wants to play with her concerts, play on stage, come up and play with her on stage. So 
social media got into it and saying, why aren't they paying? Why isn't she paying them? She's just using them. She said, well, we don't have the money. We're going to give you a hug and a kiss or something like that. And uh, a week later, she said, we're paying them. She said, she pays them now because social media made her pay. Well, was- that's also great that she listened. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it tells the credibility. You know, someone who's credible listens <clears throat> rather than just ignoring it. So, Dave, do you have anything to, uh, any final questions? We should probably wrap it up. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. It was a very fascinating talk. I really appreciate you coming on. I don't really, you, you covered everything that I could think of. Well, good. Check out YouTube. Check your Romney style and check out the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain. Will do. And Phil, next time I'll, I took a friend of mine who had never heard him. Uh, a friend of mine I went to high school with actually from Long Island and he was just flabbergasted. Next time they come to town, I'll take you. All right. I'll go. They were wonderful. They come out with straight face British humor, you know, that sarcastic British humor. So they came out and, you know, it's Carnegie Hall. Any, any musician plays Carnegie Hall. Most good. So he comes out and says, you know, we're on tour. We've been playing uh, all over and it's so great to be in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> tonight, you know, and then they go on and play full rendition of the song Hollywood. Hollywood. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just like that the whole night. They, they leave for their encore. They leave before their encore. The last two. So they go out stage left. And they're out stage left about, I don't know, you know, everybody was screaming for them to come back. So they're about a minute and a half, two minutes. They come back on and the guy says, you can't get out that way. <laughs> it's, great. it's just absolutely great. I mean, everything about them, I think it's just, you know, they really, and, and the greatest thing was that they gave us this little card instead of trying to sell us a DVD or whatever out in the, in the, out in the lobby so they get it. I have a, uh, a model I would like to try in this business because it's a live business and that is I think you should pay on the way out. You should go to a club, listen to the band and determine what you want to pay by how they play. And you know the In Rainbows experiment with Radiohead when they gave the music away for free well, pay what you want. That's what it was. Pay what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of 99 cents in those days, they made about 66 cents average for a tune. So not everybody didn't rip them off. People paid. And I think people would pay. I don't think people would just rip you off. But pay on the way out. Good idea. Get more people to come. Yeah. And you probably make more money, you know, in a long run. Well, especially a club where you got to, you know, you got to, pay for 200 people, the club owner makes you, if you're playing a circuit. So, but that's a, an interesting model that we thought of a um, couple of years ago. It has been tried in Canada on, uh, in, on some smaller venues, people paying on the way out. But I think it's a great idea. It's hmm. a good thought. That's a good thought. So, I, if it were up to me, we would talk for another hour, and I, I'm already saying... I hope you'll come back and do this again because there's much more. Only with Aaron Van Dyne. He's the, All he's right. The as long as Aaron Van Dyne does not blow us off next time the way he... The, the original fat cat. No <laughs> That's right. I could yeah. tell that all the time. But... All right. Next time, I will make sure he's here and he can call you Dr. Marcone instead of Dr. <laughs> Stephen Marcone. All right. Well, all right. It was fun. We, yes, this has been good. So we've been with Dr. Stephen Marconi, Chairman, Music Department, Music Management Department, William Patterson University, formerly college, now university. I am Dave Phil. And I am David Deutsch. An alum. I am an alum of William Patterson. It was the college then, now it's the university, so I changed my resume. I'm not stupid. And uh, Marconi actually helped me. So I got actually my first music industry gig from uh, interning my whole senior year back in 89 and 90. And uh, Mm-hmm. Worked with a guy who uh, David and I are actually going to try and interview in the near future. This guy named Jim Capero, who ended up being uh, eventually chairman of Island Def Jam Records for a while. So right with um, well, well, I guess he was alone. Or was he was Lear at that time? I can't remember. He was I think they were called at the time, weren't they? Mm-hmm. I can't remember. I think he was chairman. Lior might have been president or something, and then Jim. No left and then Lior took over, Kevin Lyles became president. Yeah. We had Lyles here last, last year, you know. He spoke uh, uh, in April in our, our seminars that we do every spring. 
Mm -hmm. So he was here. He was wonderful to the kids. But what, what was very nice about it, you know, he's got a book out and he talks about going from intern to CEO in six years. Oh. But he was very, very um, humble. And he told the kids, and a lot of minorities were right there, of course, in the in the first row, that he's worth two hundred million dollars. And he didn't say it being that I'm worth, you know, he had his Maybach and so on. But he was telling, he's basically saying, you can do this. And he has a whole um, sort of a self awareness program that he sells. I think it's one hundred ninety nine dollars. He gave it all for free. All the kids just take it, you know. So he was really good, but I claim, why I'm getting to this, I claim that I have brought to campus the richest man ever to walk on that kid. <laughs> I think he's, he's far richer than Kostakis, who gave us the money for the uh, for the business building. I mean, this guy's worth $200 million. <laughs> that's a lot of money. So, so I guess you're not worth 200 that's No, no, that's, that's Jay-Z money, you know, that story about Jay-Z walking out of the restaurant. And he liked the restaurant so much, uh, so he decided to buy the building. <laughs> he did. That's a true story. He did that. <laughs> it's called the Barclays Center. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Dr. All Spencer. right, good. Always good to see you. It's always good to be seen, which is just a lame response. <laughs> thank you, David Deutsch. Yes, thank you, David. take care, David. Thank you, Dr. Marconi. Thank you very much.